Wow. It will be worth it all, folks, when we see Christ. It will be worth it all. Amen. Well, we're starting a new series on winning at relationships. And this morning, I want us to look at fighting for an awesome marriage. And I encourage you to take your sermon notes out and follow along. Just six things you'll need to fill in this morning. Not a whole lot of writing. Maybe some underlining circle and some notes. And there's even one that's not even in there you want to write in uh, later. But we're looking at fighting at for an awesome marriage. Paul says this. Paul was not married, but he wrote this. He was a single adult, and he says in 1 Corinthians 7.7, 7, We're all given different gifts. God gives the gift of marriage to some, and others he gives the gift of singleness. So not everyone is supposed to be married. God says in his word that he gives gifts gives different gifts. Some have the gift of marriage. Some don't have the gift of marriage. It used to be called celibacy, but we all know that that means singleness. Now, how do you know if you have the gift to be single? Here's the way that you know if you have the gift of singleness. If you have any desire to get married someday, you don't have the gift. You don't have this gift. But if you say, you know, I, I really, if you say, I really like to be married someday, I'd like to have a wife, I'd like to have a husband, then you don't have the gift of singleness. The gift of singleness, when God gives it, it means I'm perfectly happy to live the rest of my life unmarried. That's the gift of singleness. Now, whether you have never been married, or whether you've been divorced, whether you've been separated, whether you've been widowed, whether you've been, you're currently married, Regardless of the state that you are in right now, this next verse applies to all of us. And here it is. Marriage should be honored by everyone. What do you think everyone means? Everyone. That's exactly right. So regardless of whether I'm married or not married, whether I've been married in the past and I'm not now, whatever the state I'm, the Bible says very clearly that marriage is to be honored by everyone, and God means everyone. But sadly, marriage is no longer honored by everyone in our society. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Today, marriage is dismissed as irrelevant by many people, uh, as archaic. I mean, who needs to get married? That's something maybe for an older generation, but not, but not for this hip generation. Uh, it's just man-made, and really it's dismissed. Nobody needs to get married today. It's demeaned by many people. Marriage is demeaned. It's a career buster. Don't get married. Well, there goes your career. Marriage is delayed. People are, get, being, are delaying marriage more and more. Many times for the wrong reasons. There are some good reasons to, be, to delay marriage, but many times it's for the wrong reasons. Marriage is being redefined. It's being ridiculed. It's being demeaned. It's being denounced. It's being discouraged. It's being respected, disrespected. We don't live in a culture where marriage is honored by everyone. And even Christians fall into this trap. Part of the problem is today, nobody knows the purposes of marriage. Fifty years ago, if I had gone on the street and say, tell me the purposes of marriage, um, most people could give five or six reasons for marriage. But ask that today, and people could hardly come up with any reasons and the purposes of of marriage. So, so marriage now is just treated just as another lifestyle option, choice. But it's not that. It's much, much more. Whether you get married or not, it's absolutely, marriage is, is, is absolutely essential. God gave us marriage for six reasons, and most people don't know why marriage matters. Most people have either an unrealistic view of marriage, which no one and nobody could ever measure up to, or they just are flat out wrong about the meaning and the purpose of marriage and what it's designed for. Most people don't get it right. A lot of people think marriage uh, solves, uh, uh, creates problems. I didn't have any problems until I got married. Oh, no. That's wrong, too. Marriage doesn't solve your problems. Marriage 
does not create your problems, marriage reveals your problems. <laughs> if I'm cranky, now this is hypothetical. <laughs> if I'm cranky, my, it's going to be revealed in my marriage. If I'm a perfectionist, it's going to be revealed in my marriage. If I'm fearful, if I'm insecure, if I worry, I'm a worry wart, my marriage is going to reveal that. If I'm controlling, if I'm manipulative, guess what? That's going to be revealed in my marriage. Marriage reveals them. They just, it just shows up in marriages like no other relationship. Now, I've known people who've gone through multiple relationships. Matter of fact, someone told me this morning that their mother had been married nine times. Um, and I was talking, was sharing, and, and she got a jewel on the last one, and that person led them, uh, her, her mother to Christ. And that's exciting. But, you know, people go, you know, I've been married, I've been, you know, I'm in all these relationships, and, man, they really stink. Well, what do you think, you know, the, what do you think the common denominator is? I want to say you. That's right. It's you. You keep taking yourself to each new marriage, each new uh, relationship. And so this morning we're going to look at the six reasons, the six purposes of marriage. And so take your notes and write this one in first. First of all, God created marriage for the connection of men and women. I want to go down a slide there, I think. Yes. Why marriage matters. God created it for the connection of men and women. God created marriage for that. I want to show you this next verse from 1 Corinthians 11.11. 11. It says this on the screen. Neither man nor woman can go, at, can go it alone. Out of the message. Neither man nor woman can go at, it, can go at life alone. That's a radical statement. A lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people say women don't need men. Why would I need a man? And a lot of men say, why would I need a woman? Well, you do. And God who designed you, created you, whether you ever get married or not, if you're a woman, you need men. And men, whether you get married or not, we need women in our life. Why? Because nobody has the full image of God. It takes both man and and woman together that's the true adam in genesis 1 27 it's the true adam the fullness of god is male and female and nobody has it without the other now going back to the bible then in genesis chapter 2 it goes on about it gives us more detail of creation in chapter 2 and there we see that god created man first now, why did God create man first? And I know what some of you women are going to say. Because he said, I could do better. <laughs> I think God, besides maybe that, I think God created man first so he could see that he had a need. He had a need. And that need could only be met in, in a woman, in women. Matter of fact, he, he, God wanted Adam to realize how much he needed women in his life. The Bible says this in, in Genesis 2.18. The only time it says this, all chapter 1, every time God created something, it said it is good. And now in chapter 2, he says it's not good. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a companion who is right for him. Now notice, the first thing you need to realize in this verse is that marriage, gender, sex, men, women, all these differences, this is a God-given thing. And God intended marriage, one of the purposes of marriage, is as an antidote. That would be a good thing to write down. It would have been good for me to put a slide there. It's an antidote to loneliness. Marriage is an antidote to loneliness. If you've been married and you're, you lose your spouse whether by life or have to, a uh, spouse has to be put in, in a, a care facility or something, you understand how much you miss your spouse. Marriage is an antidote 
to loneliness. Um, there's a lot of great relationships in life, but there's nothing that compares to the companionship of a man and a woman who are committed to each other for the rest of their life. There's nothing quite like that. And it's in this relationship, it's in this relationship that God calls marriage, and, 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 and there's no other relationship that could possibly compare. Here's what Jesus said about it in Mark 10. God's plan has been seen from the beginning of creation when he made us male and female. You see, God makes males and God makes females. And God chooses what he wanted you to be. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united as one body. Now, since they are no longer two but one, God's, God sees a married couple as one, no one should separate them, for God has joined them together. This is a very, very important passage, and we, we could spend a lot of time on that, but let me just make a few points out of this passage. Number one, marriage is God's plan. And you could write that one down. Write it somewhere in the side of your notes there. Marriage is God's plan. It's not a human plan. It's not Madison Avenue. It's not Hollywood. It's God's plan. It's not the state. It's not the government's idea. It's God's plan. God invented marriage. When he invented you, when he invented you, and when he invented humanity, marriage is God's plan. The second thing that this verse tells us is that marriage is between a man and a woman. It's between a man and a woman. There are a lot of other relationships, but those are not marriages. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Their body parts fit together for that purpose, the creation of everyone else. The third thing it says is that marriage is to be permanent. That means forever. It says uh, what God joins together, God joins a couple of marriage, no one, no one else should separate. It's to be permanent. It's meant to be for life. So do you realize how radical these three statements are? That marriage is God's idea and God's plan, that marriage is between a man and a woman, and that marriage should be permanent. No one believes that anymore. But it's still the truth. It's still the truth. It's still the way God has designed marriage. And just because we live in reality doesn't mean we ignore the ideal. This is the ideal. Those three things. Marriage is God's plan. Marriage between a man and a woman. And marriage is to be permanent. As a pastor, I've done a few marriages and uh, across my years, and, and even in our own marriage, uh, wedding ceremony, I mean, um, I've done a few weddings, and in our own wedding, we wrote our own vows, and it's kind of neat to write your own vows and to hear things, but sometimes these vows are about at the level of junior highs, junior hires. You know, they'll, they'll say something like this, I'll love you as long as the sun shines. Well, what happens if it rains tomorrow? I love you because you make me feel so great. What happens if they are in the hospital and they can't make you feel great? You just divorce them? I love you because you're so beautiful. You, give me the mic. You are so beautiful. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to do that. That's just added. I hate to tell you this. She's going to lose her beauty, and you already have. <laughs> that is, that's love if. That's conditional love. It's, it's love that makes, that's not the love that makes a marriage last. It's, it's like a contract today in marriage. It sounds really like a 36-month lease. It's like, I love you as, as long as we both shall love. I mean, really? I love you until debt us do part. Right? I love you until divorce do us part. And they're leaving out God. So the first thing about marriage is that God created it. He created it for the, the connection of a man and woman for life. Number two, write this down. 
God created marriage for the multiplication of the human race. By the way, this is how you got here. <laughs> it's through marriage. You're sitting where you're sitting because a couple got together and they made you. Can we say that in church? Well, that's what happened, okay? God populated the human planet through marriage. For thousands of years, uh, billions of people have come into existence because of men and women. They got married. And God says, that's part of my plan. Let me give you a little background on this. The Bible says that God is love. We talk about this many times. It's, it's God's character. It's God's nature. The only reason that, that there's love in the universe is because God is love. Worms don't love. Ants don't love. They're not created in the image of God. But you love and we can love because we're created in the image of God. And God says, I want to love and I want to express my love. And the Bible says that everything God made, God made simply in order to love it. You were made for God to love. And God created us and created the world, and God wanted the family to love. And God loves everyone and created you and created everyone, even though God knew that some would reject his love. God is love. And God created this family, and God wants you, and God wants everyone in heaven with him for all of eternity. Now think about this. God chose everyone who's going to be in heaven to come into existence through marriage and sex. That's the way he chose. No one would be in heaven if God hadn't created marriage. Because everyone has to come into existence for that tool that he designed. So let me show you a couple of verses. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created people in his own image. He patterned them after himself, creating both male and female in his image. See, there it is creating both male and female in his image. So males don't have all the image of God, and females don't have all the image of God. We both get parts of God's image. Then God blessed them, male and female, and commanded them. Now here's the very first command God gives to the human race. I want you to read it out loud with great gusto. Ready? Here we go. God commanded, read it with me, to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. That's God's first command, is to get married and have sex. And by the way, that's about the only command that man has done really good at across the years. <laughs> There's seven billion of us on the planet because your parents and their parents and their parents and their parents and their parents were fruitful and multiplied and filled the earth and raw here. The point is, God says one of the purposes of marriage is the multiplication of the human race. It's not the only purpose, but it's a big one. Look at this next verse in Malachi 2.15. I love this in the message. It's a paraphrase. It says, God, not you. You may want to circle that, underline the not you. Circle would be really good. God, not you, made marriage. His spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. And what does he want from marriage? God's really clear here, godly children from your union. Because if people don't have kids, those kids aren't going to be born, and they can't get into heaven, and God wants godly children from the union. So guard the spirit of the marriage within you. This is not an indictment for couples who are childless. Um, there are people who want to have kids, but they, they can't have kids, and that's, that's a whole, God is not disappointed with you. But we live in a broken world. Our DNA is broken. Our bodies are broken. And things have happened that we can't. But God's purpose was to populate the earth. So, the third reason God created marriage. For the connection of men and women. For the multiplication of the human race. And three, for the protection of children. God created, God invented marriage for the protection of children. We all know that kids grow better, healthier, stronger when they grow up in a stable home. And when they grow up in a marriage, in a marriage that has both a mother and a father. Why did God create marriage for the protection of children? 
Because when you were born, you were completely helpless. <laughs> you couldn't do anything. You couldn't feed yourself. You couldn't dress yourself. You couldn't change your own diaper. You couldn't blow your nose. You could. When you were born, you couldn't even turn over on your back. You were literally totally helpless. And God knew that children needed a safe environment. And you were going to need someone to feed you, to dress you, to nurture you. And you're going to need someone to protect you, guide and train you, to care for you, and all these things. So let me give a summary of, a, of, of, a, some, of 150 studies on the impact of marriage, negative or positive, on children. Studies have shown that if children grow up, grow up without two parents, without a mom and dad, there's an increased risk that they're going to, A, fail in school, Kids without two parents are more likely to not graduate from college. Kids without two parents are more likely to be involved in substance or alcohol abuse. They're more likely to experience distress, depression, and the risk of suicide. They're more likely to do jail time. They're more likely to have their entire lives in, to live their entire lives in poverty. They're more likely to increase the risk that they themselves will divorce or bear children outside of marriage. On the other hand, Children who live with their own two parents growing up and statistically proven will enjoy better physical health than children living in any other family form. Now, I didn't say this. This is what about 150 different studies have shown. How about women? Studies have shown that women who marry and stay married have lower rates of depression than either single women or mothers cohabitating with a guy they're not married to. Women who marry and stay married have a lower risk of being a victim of crime. They have a lower risk of violence in their life. Women who marry and stay married have a higher net worth than those who are living with a man they're not married to. Interesting, isn't it? I don't think the news might report that, but you need to hear these studies. These are facts. How about men? Studies have shown that men who marry and stay married earn more money than the single men with similar education, job histories. And men who marry and stay married live longer than single men. Men who marry and stay married amass more net worth than those who live with a woman not being married to them. And men who marry and stay married have fewer injuries and illnesses. Now what is that saying? It's saying something very, very simple. When you do things God's way, it works. It works. Every single study done has proven that kids develop best with a mom and a dad. We're on a broken planet. Not everything works right. We know that. But it doesn't mean that we can say that the, once again, the, that the ideal is not real. It is. The statistic bears it out. Children survive and thrive in families. Now notice this verse right here, Proverbs 14, 26. Those who obey and respect the Lord, in other words, those who do life the way God says it, those who obey and respect the Lord, have a secure fortress. Their children, underline this, their children have a place of refuge and security. If you want your children to have a place of refuge and security, obey the Lord. Respect the Lord. And you will have this. In the past, we used to hear about couples and say they stayed together for the sake, sake of the kids. For many generations, when people would stay together for the sake of the kids. And that was considered to be an honor and considered to be a compliment. Well, today, we laugh at that statement. As a matter of fact, I have heard people say, we're separating for the sake of the children. It would be better if mom and dad are not together. There's a Greek word for that, and it's boulder dash. <laughs> that is a lie right from the pit of hell. Because I've been at the camps, I've been at the altars, where kids have been praying, and they are blaming themselves for your divorce. Tell me it was for the sake of the kid. It wasn't. It was because you're selfish and you're immature and you want to have what you want. And guess what? When you get married, you don't get to do what you want all the time. 
Right? Everybody can agree to that one? God created marriage for the connection of men and women, for the multiplication of the human race. That's all we got. That's how we got here. For the protection of children. Number four, this is a big one. God created marriage. <laughs> kind of alluded into the last one. For the perfection of our character. <laughs> That's right. It's in relationships that we learn to be unselfish. We learn to be loving. And no relationship has a greater impact on your character than the relationship of marriage. Another one of the facts about when you were born, not only you were helpless, you were completely self-centered. Nothing on planet Earth is more self-centered than a new baby. It doesn't have the capacity to think of anyone else. All it can think about is itself. I'm too hot. I'm too cold, I'm hungry, I just pooped, I need to be cleaned up, whatever. The first word a baby learns is I. It's all about me as a baby. And maturity and the purpose of life is to grow up and realize that it's not all about you. In fact, real happiness comes in giving your life away and being unselfish and, and s serving and being loving. So the whole goal of your life is to grow from being totally self-centered as a baby to being an unselfish adult. Now, I've been waiting all morning to say this one. Do you know some adults who are still selfless babies? Yes, you do, and don't look at them right now either. <laughs> We're talking about maturity, and the marriage is the laboratory where we can mature, and we can grow, and we can learn to love because God is love. And God wants you to become like him, and he wants you to learn how to love, and we learn how to be unselfish. Proverbs 18.1 says, it's, uh, it's self, selfish and stupid to think only of yourself. Now, if you're a parent and you don't let your kids say the word stupid, you may want to check a different translation for that one. But it's true. It is selfish and it is stupid to think only of yourself. So how do I get out of that? Well, marriage is a life long course and learning to be unselfish. Because once I got married, I can no longer think about me. I got to think about we. Does that make sense? I move from me to we. And counseling couples, and, and I know, and counseling my own son, I, I've said, you need to start asking questions. How is this going to affect us? God, what do you want from us? us rather than just what do you want me to do God will you if you guys are looking a long relationship and going towards marriage you need to start thinking about we rather than just me because when you're you don't when you're married you don't get to do everything you want to do you got to learn to compromise you got to learn to think of the other person marriage is a laboratory for learning how to love Listen, God wants you to make, God wants to make you like Jesus. The number one goal in your life, he wants you to grow up. He wants to build your character. And if you're not, if, if you're not building your character, that's the only thing you see you could take with you to heaven is your character. And God wants to restore, God wants to restore your character or make your character into the characteristics of Jesus. The number one tool God uses that in your life to build up your character is your spouse. The Holy Spirit will use your spouse probably better than anyone else because it's really hard to hide in a marriage. So the purpose of God in a marriage in your life is that you become more and more loving and more giving and more serving and more sharing, more mature and more unselfish. And as you become that, guess what? You get more happiness. You never, you'll never be happy. God's goal in your life is holiness. And as you become more and more like Jesus, you become holy. And holiness will bring about happiness. 
Happiness is like trying to catch an eluding butterfly. You could never, if you're just seeking after happiness, and we've learned, I've taught you that happiness comes from the word of happenings. And so we have a whole society that's after, they want to be happy. I'm happy when I go to Disneyland or Disney World. I'm happy when I'm riding the rides. I'm unhappy when I come home and I get the bill. Okay? Happiness comes from the word happenings. But if you pursue holiness, happiness is a byproduct. Joy is a byproduct. And in marriage, you can develop holiness. God wants you to learn, learn how to love in marriage. Romans 12 says, love sincerely. Hold on to what is good. Be devoted to each other and like a loving family. Excel in showing respect to each other. Okay. So God made marriage for the connection of men and women, the multiplication of the human race, the protection of children, the perfection of our character. Number five, for the construction of our society, for the construction of society. Marriage is the fundamental building block of every community, church, state, nation, society, culture. If you know anything about history, you know that where marriages are strong, cultures and, nature, and, and, and nations are strong. Empires are strong. You know that whenever marriages and families are weak, the culture, the society, the state, the government is weak. The nation is on a decline. Folks, and I think you'd agree with me, we have a real obvious problem in our nation. Our nation is going in the wrong direction. America is not getting better. It's not getting stronger. It's going the other direction. Why? Because we do not value marriage and family anymore. We value it's all about me. Me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity. I've got to do what's best for me. We've made individualism an idol. And so it's for the construction of society. Proverbs 14, 34 says this. Righteousness, doing it God's way, lifts up a nation, but sin, what sin? Not doing God's way, brings disgrace to any society. When our society is not doing it God's way, it brings disgrace. The society collapses. But righteousness... Doing it God's way. Living God's way lifts up a nation. Number six, and this is the most important reason of all, and many of you have never even heard this reason for marriage, but it's the primary and the deepest and the most fundamental reason that God created marriage for the reflection, God created marriage for the reflection of our union with Christ. Marriage is a metaphor. It is a symbol. It's a walking, living, object lesson of how much God loves and how much we are to be in relationship with him. Marriage is a model of profound spiritual truth. It's a metaphor of showing us how we are to relate to God. Let me show you by one of the, one of the deepest passages of scriptures. Paul's actually talking about the church and Christ, but he uses marriage as a metaphor. Ephesians 5 says this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, guys, you should underline that. And if the guy doesn't have his sermon notes out, then you, as the spouse, ladies, if your husband's next to you, you underline that for him. We are to love our wives as... Just as, not less, not, not less, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus, it wasn't about Jesus being superior. Jesus washed dirty feet. He says, if I, your, your master, washes your feet, if I, your master and Lord, you should do the same. I came not to serve, to be served, Jesus, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. We are to love our, li our li wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
He died so that he could give the church to himself as a bride in all her beauty. In the same way, there it is again, husbands should love their wives as they love their own bodies. No one ever hates his own body but feeds and cares of it. And that is what Christ does for his church, his body. The church is a bride. The church is the body. The scripture says, he's quoting the verse in Genesis that we just looked at. The scripture says, a man is united with his wife and the two become one body. This is a profound mystery. I'm talking about Christ and the church. Wait a minute, I I thought, Paul, you were talking about marriage here, husbands and wives. No, he's using this as, all this is true about our marriage, but he's using this as a metaphor of our spiritual union with Christ and his love for his family, for his body, the bride, the church. So, because marriage is a metaphor of Christ and the church, each husband must love his wife as much as he loves himself, and each wife must respect her husband. That passage is so deep. We don't have time this morning to to dive into it. But I want to give you some points out of this real, real quick. There's, there's, There's profound benefits we've already looked at that about marriage that are quantifiable. You could see it from the, the reports, the studies. But, but this one, this mo- most profound meaning of marriage is not as easy to grasp. It's hard to understand and appreciate how marriage is, reflects our union with Christ. You see, there's no other relationship on planet Earth, none, including the parent and child relationship. No other Ill- relationship can adequately illustrate our union with Christ the way a marriage between a man and a woman does. This is the strongest reason, number six, why marriage matters. It's the strongest reason why marriage cannot be redefined. It's the strongest reason we must protect marriage no matter the cost because we are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ and marriage is that metaphor. Let me summarize. What I'm saying before we get to into the practical part is it really doesn't matter what other people think about marriage. It doesn't matter what their public opinion is. It doesn't matter what the opinion polls are. It doesn't matter what, uh, what is politically correct, or what is politically not correct. It doesn't even matter what the Supreme Court votes. What really matters is what God says who invented marriage. And if you're going to live in a culture where this is absolutely counterculture, if you, you now live in a culture that has forgotten what marriage matters, We need to know why marriage matters, why God created it. And as a result, we can see what's happening in our society. We could go to Las, you could go to Las Vegas, you could get drunk, and then spontaneously in a moment go to a wedding chapel and get married, and 24 hours later get divorced because it's no big deal. It's a social contract. We have celebrities who will spend a full year and millions and millions and millions of dollars on a wedding and the preparation, listen, the preparation for the wedding lasts longer than the marriage. We have people going from one relationship to the next in serial marriages. They don't understand the meaning and the mystery. What's amazing about all of this is when we, that we live in a culture that's forgotten why marriage matters, we, will, we still honor and we make big news when a couple lives for a long time. How many here have been married to your spouse, or maybe they've been deceased, but you've been married at least to your spouse for 40 years or more? Let me see your hands. Okay, we're just going to play a game here. Okay, hands down. How about 45 years you've been married to the same person? Oh, this is good. Good stuff. Let's go for the 50s. How many on the 50s? And some, some spouses aren't here yet, but you've been married 50. Okay, well, do we have 55 years you've been married together? Okay, I see those hands. So we got three here. And we have a 60. Been married, you were married together for 60 years. 50. Uh, Mother Superior? How many years? You were married 70. Well, okay, you would have been married 73 years. Oh, she's, see how positive she is? I'm still married to him. He's, he's in heaven waiting for me, but I'm still married to him. Uh, Shelby? Seven, seven, 
72 years. Yeah. What's that? Purple. Surely. 61 years, and they're both here. Are they the oldest that are here today, 61? I mean, buried the longest? Stand up. We want to give you applause. Paul and Shirley. Yeah, there's something that rings true. We celebrate that. We see it all the time. Even with the most secular, most liberal, most uh, non-God-fearing uh, media, when there's a couple that's there and they've been married for 61 years, there's, there's something that rings true. That's because that's the way God made us. That's the way God made us. We know down deep in our side that's the way it is. And and, and down deep inside, that's what everybody wants, this type of relationship. Let me just end this section, this part. Twice in the Bible, Jesus says that there's going to be no marriage in heaven. Huh? No marriage in heaven? Jesus said twice. And Jesus knows more about it than, than you or I. Why would there be no marriage in heaven? Because you, don't, you won't need any of the six reasons marriage exists. In a perfect place, you're not going to need the multiplication of the human race. In a perfect place, you're not going to need the protection of children. In a perfect place, you're not going to need the perfection of your character. In a perfect place, you're not going to need um, the construction of society. You're not going to need to reflect Christ's union. You won't need a metaphor because in heaven, you'll be experiencing the real thing. But here on earth, marriage matters. And the Bible says we are to honor it, whether we're ever married or we're married or lost a maid or whatever, we are to honor marriage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you, Lord, for marriage. We thank you, Lord, for uh, putting all this together. And I pray, Lord, that we may honor it as you'd want us to honor it. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. I am not Lynette, as you can see, but uh, announcements are here in your, your uh, bulletin. I encourage you to take them out. As Ralph said, he alluded to the uh, East Valley Corral. Uh, go ahead, gentlemen. And, and one of the things I quickly do is I look at today. I look at upcoming. Today, there's a 401 class. If you've taken 101 and are a member of this church, even if you haven't taken 201, 301, we let you skip. We'll let you skip to 401. Lunch is provided. That's in the coffee house. Finance committee meeting this week. Our quizzes, first quiz meet will be this Saturday. Here at this church, uh, probably 9 o'clock. If you've never seen Teen Quizzing, come. Board meeting next week along, along with leadership and a lunch for all our, our lay pastors, lay ministry leaders. And then we have children's quiz coming up. All those details right in here. The first Sunday of October is our Friendship Sunday. You'll be getting more information on that and things that you can pass out to give out to your friends and neighbors. So I encourage you to start thinking about that and start encouraging people to come for our free barbecue and our special Friendship Sunday. Five minutes till, six minutes till, by that clock back there. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great day. We'll see you later.